Good afternoon. Hi, I have a phone here. Um, I don't know whose it is. So, not lost and found just yet. Um, as, <laughs> as Crystal stated, I am Marissa Streitz. I am the research project manager in the administration core here at the Knight ADRC. And I'd like to share with you some of our experiences exploring various methods with which to collect social de determinants of health in our research participants. So a little bit of background, Megan and Shana did an excellent job um, laying the foundation for us, so I won't belabor this point too much. But what I will say is that as a center, we were thinking about some of the, what factors may be contributing to the racial disparities that are seen in ADRD. Now, I'm a clinical social worker, right? So I still tend to look at things through a social justice lens. And when I read earlier research suggesting that maybe these disparities were in part at least due to um, biological difference between races, it didn't make a lot of sense. We know that race is a social construct. So why aren't we looking at social factors? And um, that's, that's where we started with this. We also thought that these determinants, um, considering determinants within a research context might give us a better understanding of the certain modifiers of ADRD prevalence rates. So to get started, we knew that there were a lot of determinants to choose from, and it just isn't feasible for us to collect them all, um, especially regarding participant burden. So we started looking through the literature, what's already known, what's still missing, what are other ADRCs doing? And from reading the through the literature, we found that a lot of research efforts at that time really lacked appropriate measures with which to collect social determinants of health. We also learned of more broad measures like the frequently discussed Area Deprivation Index from Dr. Amy Kind and her colleagues at Wisconsin, and which essentially measures disparity across the neighborhood level. And we really liked that idea, and we wanted to add to it and uh, measure this at an individual level as well. And last, we just sought out previously existing measures. There's no need for us to reinvent the wheel. Um, specific considerations for our center included that we wanted it to easily integrate into our current research protocol, um, pr probably the clinical assessment. It could be used for both cognitively unimpaired and very mildly symptomatic participants. And last, the option, we wanted an option to um, offer the participants a way to complete the SS, I'm sorry, um, to complete the battery on their own at home. And I'll tell you, it's a really good thing we made this last consideration because we began this project uh, right before the COVID shutdown. <laughs> okay, so uh, we kept finding articles on the influence of one's socioeconomic status, on both physical and cognitive health. Not surprising, right? Resources grant access and options in healthcare. We know this. We also learned of other correlations um, between lifetime socioeconomic status and ADRD. And so measuring just one point of time is not, um, is not sufficient because we know that SES can fluctuate. So something even as far back as your childhood SES could potentially impact your risk for later life um, AD. Now, we already collected participant information, um, their occupational information, via the Hollingshead Index, which is fine, um, but it's not comprehensive, nor does it account for fluctuations in SES across the lifespan. So it was about this time when we learned of a measure um, from Dr. Lila Besser that she was testing the Life Course Socioeconomic Neighborhood Exposures Questionnaire, which looks at not only 
um, socioeconomic status across the lifespan, but also other, other um, characteristics such as green space, your neighborhood, so neighborhood characteristics. And of course, um, our colleagues at the Rush ADC um, were, had already been collecting education information, um, especially early life education information, um, and their minority aging research study. So we did adopt a few questions from that protocol as well. Um, the other measures that we were interested in looking at, um, which we kept learning, was stress, social status, um, even social support, and physical activity. So because stress comes in all forms, um, acute stress, uh, stress due to discrimination, um, just lifetime, life, uh, daily life stress, then we needed to measure stress in a variety of manners. So that's why we added the perceived stress scale, everyday discrimination scale, and the adverse childhood event scale to kind of get at those factors which might be causing participants stress. We also added the multidimensional scale of perceived social support as a social support measure, and the MacArthur scale of social, I'm sorry, of subjective social status was added um, to measure where our participants felt that they stood among their peers. And last, um, we added the International Physical Activity Questionnaire, um, the long form, and that was really to measure how much exercise our participants were getting across other domains, not just um, going to the gym and working out, but how much exercise at their job, uh, during leisure, and including the amount of time spent sitting. So we constructed this battery and it's, you know, we're excited about it, but how did we know if it was culturally sensitive or inclusive? Well, we did it. So one of the ways that we did is we consulted with our very own African American Advisory Board, whom you've heard about this morning. And um, this is a draft battery. Um, I presented the proposed battery to the board a few members agreed to give me specific feedback after they've completed the first draft of the battery. And um, yes, it was, it was very helpful for them to give us this information. Mostly they found that the battery was not too long, um, but we did make some specific changes um, to some of the measures within the, um, the battery that we had. Um, to make instructions more clear. So all this work led to the Life Courses Influencing Aging and Dementia, or the LIAD battery. So the LIAD is like the, the baby of the SS dyad. So that comes after. Um, but the LIAD is, is first. So we had to pilot it, obviously, with participants. Um, we did build it in REDCap, so it would only be um, taken electronically. We did this, again, to kind of make sure that um, our participants could continue on with this, because again, it was during the COVID shutdown. Um, so we did build it in REDCap. Between um, September 1st through November 20th, our research coordinators called and asked participants to participate in this pilot study. We aimed for an N of about 100, and participants were asked to complete the LIAD battery once, and then again two weeks later. Again, still, still electronic. You can see some of the demographics from this. We um, actually 112 people, 112 of our participants can, agreed to complete it. Um, their mean age, you could tell, 69. Over half were female. Um, 20, almost 29% self-identified as black or African-American, and we tried to get as many very mildly symptomatic or um, CDR 0.5 participants as possible um, to take the battery, and we ended up with 20. Okay, so first things first, the first things we learned about is we needed paper copies. Paper copies uh, were needed. <laughs> uh, I cannot stress that enough. <laughs> um, and here's why. So 
um, if the participants decided to decline uh, to participate in the pilot study, our research coordinators recorded the reasons for these declines. And <laughs> interestingly or not, only 24 people said no. But of these 24 people, 16 participants declined, not because they didn't want to participate, but because they, one, were uncomfortable with the technology, or two, lacked access to the internet, a computer, or a, smart, or a smartphone. Again, access, options, you need resources. Um, so this, this group, interestingly, were older, of course, than our um, than those who agreed to complete the pilot study, so their average age was about 81. Um, 11 out of the 16 participants who um, let us know that the, that the, um, I'm sorry, that the technology issues were a problem, self-identified as black or African American, and six of these participants were very mildly symptomatic or CDR 0.5. Um, our biostatistics core provided us with a great statistical analysis of this, the LIAD pilot study. Um, most of the individual measures demonstrated satisfactory interclass correlation. Um, however, the multidimensional scale of perceived social support did not, so we swapped it out with the established Lubin social network scale. Also, the International Physical Activity Questionnaire was later removed um, because of participant feedback. Um, interestingly, it it's, was difficult for them to complete on their own. It was something that really should be completed with the research coordinator. Oop. Here we go. Okay, so following the results of the LIAD pilot study, we learned that Shana Stites and her colleagues at the University of Pennsylvania, ADRC, were developing a measure with which to collect social determinants of health. And so our batteries were somewhat similar, so we decided to create one harmonized battery that we could administer between both sites. Um, so that battery, as Shana said, is the social and structural determinants influencing aging and dementia which is the battery that Shana just described. And we've ourselves been administering the SS Dyad um, since May of 2021. And so far we've had over 640 participants complete the initial version, um, but even over 200 have completed the, the follow-up version as well. So for current and future collaborations, um, we know it's important to fuel and to foster our relationships with the other ADRCs, with you all, especially if you're interested in social determinants of health. So um, we are quite lucky. Our biostatistics core leader, Dr. Kenji Zhang, he received an R01 examining racial disparities in AD biomarkers. So Kenji and his team have been working with other ADRCs um, to collect a plasma, a CSF, um, and com combine some of our samples in our data. Um, specific sites including Emory, University of Alabama at Birmingham, and University of Wisconsin-Madison, along with UPenn. Um, so these sites have even agreed to administer at least part of, if not all of, the SS Dyad battery. And finally, we are excited to start um, the night ADRC will participate in Stride with Dr. Megan Zulsdorf, whom you heard um, from at the beginning. Megan's already described Stride, but what I will say is that we are also excited to collect several universal measures of stress and stress exposure and social resources with our research participants. So thank you for your time today and for attending this conference and I think we're gonna have a panel in just a minute. <laughs> <laughs>